I went through every thought you can imagine in five years, you know, like uh, the first 18 months was hard to stop jumping onto a piano or expecting to do something because I'd been sort of turning out singles and albums since 1962 on the on call, as it were, you know, three every three months a single, every six months an album, so I was sort of like a robot, you know. Did you um, make a con? You made a conscious decision to stop. Yeah, it was uh, it was harder to stop than to continue. Although I don't think continuing would have done me any good, you know, artistically. But it was it's, it's very hard to stop. I kept thinking this must be what it's like when guys get retired at 65 and they're still alive and kicking, but somebody pushed a button and they have to go. So I kind of dealt with that. You know, what would one do if what one wasn't doing it? And uh, gradually I got into being a house husband or with Sean or whatever. But at first I was very sort of frantic all the time, didn't know what to do, you know, there seemed to be endless time, you know. Is that really what you did? I mean, when you say you were a house yes, husband... Yes, I did it. I was there for three meals a day. You didn't travel? You didn't do other Yeah, things? I did, did a little travelling. I travelled with Sean as well, but occasionally I'd take a three-day zap around the world, like Singapore or Hong Kong or something, just three to clear days. my... Yeah, just go around very fast, you know. Were you aware of every food that went into his mouth? Every I mean, mouthful he's had since he was born, I've practically been at the table for. And uh, for the last five years, or however long it's been, 74, he was born in 75. Yeah, I've been there every day. You know. I don't know why people are so amazed about that. Because mothers are there every yeah, day, but yeah. she, she was taking care of business. You know, and one of us had to be there. I asked John what his days had been like and what he enjoyed the most about staying at home the rewards of motherhood <laughs> it's that though you know what oh, what you no. <laughs> well it's it's like anything you know uh, what you put in you get out you know i'd get all those little moments with him you know those little quiet moments when he'd say do something for the first time or express something clearly and with a whole sentence or you know he related to me like that and uh, that's what i got out of it i enjoyed being housebound because i'm i always liked hanging around the house, you know, I mean, writing music is hanging around mm -hmm. the house. And the only difference was I wasn't writing music, I was writing uh, menus, right? And I did a little cooking, I learned how to cook bread and things like that, and I went through that for about six months of cooking the, the bread for the whole household, but everybody would eat it, I'd make it on Friday to last the week, it'd be gone by Saturday. So it was a great thrill at first, you know, I took Polaroids and my first <laughs> loaf and everything, and you know, and I got that thrill of people eating your food, you know, and I was cooking fish and rice and because we're basically sort of macrobiotic, whatever that is, you know, but it's sort of in a, it's basically health food, brown rice, that kind of stuff. And, uh, but then the thrill would wear off because you wouldn't get a gold record, you'd, nothing, you know. You'd put the meal out and it would be devoured and that would be the only way you'd know if it was any good, you know. One of the things that John was most eager to talk about was his relationship with his son, Sean. The other day I got to see him for a good hour without any event going on, you know, without he was busy or I was busy or something happening. And uh, there was some something on TV, we were sort of half watching it, we were lying in the bed together. And it was something about uh, models or something. And he just, he's lying there next to me, he says, when I grow up, I want to be just a daddy. I said, Oh, I see. I said, you mean that uh, you wish I wasn't making this record, right? And I was being just a daddy. He says, yeah, that's right. So I said, well, you know what? I says, remembering all these housewives I'd seen interviewed you know, as they got liberated. I could hear myself talking. I was saying, uh, well, you see, it makes daddy happy to make the music. And if daddy's happy, then when he's with you, he won't, he'll have less tension, you know? Because he knows what tension is, he knows when I'd get tense wouldn't be when I was torn or unfulfilled, you know. And, and I said, it doesn't take long, it'll only be another week or something like that, and then, then I'll be back here with you, you know. And he says, because I have him to the studio, you know, once or twice a week to let him see what, what's going on. He says, but you don't do anything, you just sit there. So he hadn't seen me performing with the musicians or singing, you know, the first session, because I was too nervous after five years, or even after two weeks, first sessions, I'm always very hyper, so I would be rude to him or offhand, which can hurt him for a week, you know, one offhand remark, they're so sensitive. 
So he missed the exciting part, which is when everybody's banging and playing. And I, I didn't bring him into overdubs. And I was generally sitting in the seat there, you know, like listening to overdubs. And I was trying, I said, well, you know, I'm listening there. He says, no, but you didn't even, I said, it's just like a big tape recorder. He says, I know that, you explained that, but you didn't even touch it, meaning that Jack and Lee, the engineer, were, were touching it. I, I was thinking, I think, oh, you know, he thinks I just don't do anything. And what he's saying is that what I'm doing isn't worth, you know, if it's, so, it's not that much fun, you know, his idea of fun is action, you know, it's, if, if you're leaving me just to sit in a seat, you know. So, I mean, we're that close that it, it's, yeah. it is painful. I'm feeling guilt-ridden and racked, because, you know, what, what's a record compared with child? It's nothing. You know? But still, I have to do it. More than almost anyone, John Lennon knew about the pressures of the music business. During our conversation, we talked about that. If you think about it, I've been under pressure since I was 21 or 2. That's in public, you know, I mean, that's been very famous. 20, uh, let's see, 22 is when, when I signed the first contract. So I've been producing sort of under pressure for almost 12 years or 15 years. I don't know how long it is, from 1962 up till 1974. That's a long time to be expected to and churning out thousands upon thousands of things. And there comes a point where I don't want to just churn out stuff that's just craft, and cr even if it was a hit, you know, presuming it was popular, mm -hmm. that was just well crafted. Because I'm not interested in being a craftsman. I am a craftsman anyway. I've learned my trade and my craft from being in the studio and performing all those years. But I'm not interested in sustaining myself on my past reputation and, and getting away with it by craftsmanship, like some, let's say, older singers can do that. If you were just a singer, you know, you get to be 50, 60, whatever, and your voice isn't so good, but your stage presence is such that you can, it's not fake it, but you can do certain things that, that people sort of, somebody said they saw Elvis, you know. I would never see him, although I worshipped him when he was, before he went in the army and when I was a kid. But I would never go and see him in Vegas or anything like that. I asked a great fan of his, who was Mal Evans, used to work for us. Uh, I said, well, what was it like, you know? And he says, well, if you, if you pretended that you were 16, then it was all right, you see. And I didn't, I don't want to be a person where people have to pretend they're 16 to be able to watch me or to listen to me. And so if that's the way it's going to be, I will do something else, you know. What else? Had you ever considered doing anything else? I never considered doing, being a musician in, in, in a considered way, you see. I've never taken anything that considered. I was I had it, a lot of balls in the air, you know. And when I, I became a professional musician the day I got a red letter from the art, art college saying, don't bother coming back next September. Now I'm a professional musician. I got myself to a point where I can live without music. Okay. My need is for expression. Yeah. So, w so I can would it have taken another form? Yeah, probably, what? probably. Writing, painting, acting? Uh, acting, I'm not interested. Not at all. I, I, when I did How I Won the War with Dick Lester in 1966, I mean, didn't, regardless of what kind of movie it was, the main lesson I learned was it's best to be the director, because <laughs> otherwise you're just sitting on your ass all day. But I did write Strawberry Fields while I was sitting on my ass in, in a desert in Spain. But the acting was absolutely not worth it. You know, it's, I understand it's, uh, it's beautiful when you hit it, but it's not worth it. I would be only interested in directing. Directing costs money. But I'm in, just as interested in, in anything that expresses. But still, expression through the music is, is uh, second nature. Expressing through writing is second nature, and expressing through painting or visuals is second nature to me. Just my craft isn't as good mm. on, in film or, or writing. Although the writing I was doing before I was... Uh, writing and painting I did before I played music. But it's hard to say before, because I was playing mouth organ and accord, you know, all sorts of things as a kid, you know, but mainly I thought I was going to be a writer or a painter. So it's the instant satisfaction I need, you know? So it can be expressed in many ways, but uh, 
you know, so, but here I am rocking and rolling and it's fun. But if it gets not to be fun, I just walk away again because I know I can walk away now. It's not mm. the be all and end all of my life. Do you think so it's... I'm going to have fun with it like I did when we first started. So I found myself writing like I first used to write. I didn't think, you know, I wouldn't get all intense about meaningful, meaningless as Yoko wrote in Great Food a hundred years ago. You know, all that artsy-fartsy intellectual stuff. Meaningful, meaningless, meaningless, meaningful. You know, so I liberated myself from my own intellect and my own sort of image of myself. So therefore I, I could write again without consciously thinking about it, which was a, a joy, you know. You listen to Wars and Bridges, when you get, if you, if you, you want to. Were you then? It's not, yeah, I was a miserable son of a bitch, you know. I mean, I'd split from Yoko, I'd been drinking myself nearly dead. And I was really, really miserable. I was never that, um, you know, I was always a bit intense. But uh, it was really the, a miserable period, the separation and drinking and just complete loss of centeredness. But uh, so I, I'm, I count myself lucky to be alive, one. I could have uh, killed myself. Easy, uh, subconsciously. So no, I, I, you know, I mean, if I get depressed, I think I want want to jump out of a window or something. But uh, it usually passes. <laughs> well, what stopped you from doing that? Oh no, well, I I would never do it like that. I would fall under a truck when I was drunk, you know, and do it that way. I couldn't do it the honourable way, you know, like Harry Carey or something. I would have to, you know. I mean, I was stepping out of moving cars in '73. But I'd always been like that. It was just more so. You know, it, it, and I've been like that as a youngster too. But as a youngster, A, you're stronger. And B, I was all surrounded by the other Beatles and the managers and things like that who would protect me and cover for what I was doing. Paul or Brian Epstein would sort of sh shuffle me into a room or one of the road managers and before I would go wandering off into the streets again, you know, looking for action or whatever. So, but in 73, I split from yoga, there was nobody to, uh, to say no. So I just went to the extreme, I suppose. Do you credit her with having much to do with your you can, sanity? Yeah, I'd be dead or insane or both, <laughs> if it wasn't for her, sure. John and I talked about what he actually went through when he set out to write a song. I considered being possessed when when, when the really creative music comes. Meaning, I don't sit down and say, I'm going to write a song about this, that, or the other, like one would do a lot of the time when one has to produce so many records or so many songs a year. That one could afford to wait for a nowhere man or songs that had come to me in the past, music and words, as if I'm a, a medium. You see, so that's how the real, the real joy is there. So one has to not be, you know, sometimes mediums can't produce these manifestations because they, act, they start doing it on call and they get business going and then one day I say, Lisa, you know, I want to talk to so-and-so and, -so, and the, the mad thing doesn't come through because the, wo the woman blocks off. You know, mediums get blocked out too, you know, they lose it. They can have natural psychic ability as children and then suddenly, bam, they can't reach it. So, uh, Did you ever worry that you had lost it, that it wouldn't come back again? Well, maybe I didn't. I wouldn't face it because I knew I could always force something. Mm. Yeah. Did you think people would know the difference? Oh, I mean, uh, people. Well, didn't you care? No, I don't worry about people. Mm. People. I mean, I do worry about people. People. Part of me does. Okay, so I'm not. You know, I'm not saying I'm immune to criticism. I don't want to be liked or nothing like that. But when I'm creating, the creating is the joy. The, the song coming in, oh my God, you know, what's this doing? You know, it's right in itself. It's like I'm sort of watching somebody else doing it. Oh, Jesus Christ. Yeah, I use no one man as an example because simply because I remember I struggled all morning, about six hours to write a song that the day I wrote Nowhere Man in 1964 or sometime. And I finally gave up. We've all experienced this on different levels. I lay down on the couch, I was really depressed. I can't write a song. And as I lay down exhausted like that, because I'd ex I was no longer centered on this, I have to write a song. I just lay down. <laughs> you know, I picked up the guitar and the whole damn thing was there. Well, all these songs came like that. 
Over the past few years, there had been unbelievable outside pressure on John to perform and to make music again. He explained to me how he reacted to the criticism about his absence from the music scene. The thing is, I got a bit indignant about uh, Sid Bernstein, <sighs> Dave Marsh, Mick Jagger. What did Jagger say? I was in Japan at the time, and I got this English paper there, and, and it was a big thing in Observer. He said, he likes me, I like him, that business. And he says, you know, I live opposite John or something. He must have lived on the other side of the east side. You know? And he's going on about John never calls. Do you think he ever calls me? He never calls me. And he keeps changing his phone number all the time. And he's hiding behind the kid. I was hurt by it, you know, the fact that, A, I never call anybody. It's not pride. It's just that I never, ever have. Why? I never call the other Beatles. I never call anybody. They always call me. Why? Because I'm self-involved. I'm paranoid, too. I don't like phones, so you, you, there's nobody on this earth ever got a call from me that isn't related, probably, or a very old friend. And even in Liverpool, if they didn't call me, I didn't come. When I got back from, ha when we were deported from Hamburg, first George was deported, and then Paul, and I was the only one old enough to stay there, and I was working with the, the house band in, for another month or so after the others had left. This is an old, old story. Now then finally, uh, I was deported too, and I came home from uh, Hamburg on my own on the train through Holland. It was pretty scary, and I thought, mm -hmm, well, I did it, you know. I got home, I didn't call them, the other Beatles for three weeks, and they were mad at me because I hadn't called them. But I was thinking, thinking about things, you know. But this bit that somehow that you had this kind of responsibility to the world, and that you decided yeah. to become Greta Garbo or something. And Greta Hughes, I call myself. But why were they getting angry at me? You know, it's like, if I, if I was dead, they wouldn't be angry at me. If I'd conveniently died in the, in the mid-70s after a rock and roll album or Wars and Bridges and they'd all be writing this worshipful stuff about what a great guy and, you know, and wasn't he funny with a tampax on his head? You know, all that stuff, like, it's all right when you're dead, you see. And they'd all be saying, oh, what a great guy and wonderful, wonderful and that. But I didn't die, so that infuriated everybody that I would live and uh, do, do what, do what I want to do, you know, which is look after me and the family. That was the central concern, to be a family and not lose that was more important than creation and records and rock and roll and being in Billboard. <laughs>